Hi, sweet baby. I love you. <laughs> hey, Mr. Pond Balls, tell me what to do <laughs> to make all my Lunker Lake dreams come true. Hello, everybody. Bob Lusk running just a little bit late, but you know what? That's okay. Here we go. I'm gonna get to have a little time, a little fun, and talk to you guys. I've uh, well, there it goes again. So how do I stop that? Good gosh, you think I need a producer? Thought I turned the speaker off, but I missed it. So there it goes. So all right. So hey, um, boy, I made some miles today. Spent uh, oh gosh, I was in. Belzoni, Mississippi this morning, working on a lake. Started that about 8 o'clock. Got there yesterday afternoon. It was about a 510-mile ride from my house. And we finished that lake about 9.30 this morning. And uh, then I headed headed this way and stopped near Shreveport. Look at a, a lake over there with a with a new friend of mine there that's, that's uh, learning how to do some pond management stuff around Shreveport. And so then... Hooked it from there to here. So uh, just got here, just pulled in the gate, just hooked this stuff up. So figured, let's go get it. Let's go talk a little bit of pond management. So I told the girls what I was thinking about tonight, talking about, is uh, Fisheries 101. And part of the reason that prompted me to do that, and be sure and ask your questions. I see Drew Bachman. Drew's checking in from South Carolina. Good to see you, Drew. Um, I thought I'd talk about Fisheries Stuff 101. And... Hello, Doug Cusick. Hey, Chris Ketchum. Good to see you, pal, from Bells, Texas. So what I was thinking about today is, is we had our Bob Lusk Institute of Higher Pondology last week. And I was fascinated at everybody that was there. there. There were nine attendees. We had a couple of the guys coming in and out of the sessions. And it was just just really fun. And we had a, we had a, a man from uh, Wichita Falls that's in the oil and gas business that's learning how to fish, and he's probably in his late 60s, early 70s. Had a, uh, a good running buddy of ours that watches this show, um, Gary Novotny and his wife Liz coming in from Illinois. We had two students from Texas A&M. We had two wildlife biologists that do this for a living, you know, do wildlife management for a living. We had... Um, Oh, we had Dustin Brown with Pristine Ponds come over, sponsored lunch one day. He came over and attended it. So it was really, really fun, really eventful. We had a couple of landowners that have ponds, one of them, both of them locally, right there where we had it. We had the, had the event near Chapel Hill, Texas, Washington, Texas, around Brenham area. And it was a huge success. It was really fun because one of the things that, that I like to drive home when I'm working with landowners. Hello, Danny Mack, Jay Spires, Tom Davis from Ohio, Frank James. Ran through your neighborhood today, man. If I wasn't hoofing it to get back here to do this show, I would have hollered at you, but I had to go. But I will be coming back that way, so I'll holler at you. I got a couple things to do around Shreveport here in three or four weeks, so I'll give you a holler one before I come that way. Let me make sure I got everybody. Yep, I see. I see. I think I see everybody. So anyway, um... The, there were several take-home points that I got from watching and listening to the folks that attended the Institute of Higher Pondology. One of the things that they really got, they got it, it was hammered home. You, know, you guys know this, the five concepts, the five principles, the five tenets of pond management. Happy water, habitat, food chain, genetics, and harvest. And we went through all that stuff hardcore for two and a half days. It was all day. We had people arriving Wednesday. That's why I cut the show short last Wednesday because I had a lot of people and uh, one of them couldn't get in the gate because he got there late. So there was no way I could, I wasn't going to make him sit at the gate and wait for um, 20 or 30 minutes while I finish up this show. It was important to me to take care of the stuff on at the moment. My Cottrell finally got some beneficial rain coming up. Slowly. good. Yeah, it's, we're fixing to. Frank says, when you get to the question part, Bob, I have one. When the ponds fill back up again, what will happen to the inundated pond weeds? Will they deprive the water of oxygen? That's a good question. I'll tackle that here in a minute. Um, yep. Tyler Shockham Markley would love to be watching this, but college basketball has started. We'll have to catch this after. <laughs> Suits me. I know, I know where my priorities are, too. So, um... 
anyway, the other one big take home point is that when when you're working with a fisheries biologist, typically that that person is thinking more about the fish than anything. And it took me a few years to begin to figure out that it's not about the fish. The fish play a role. But when I start walking, working with it like a Danny Mac who's got a pond in his backyard, the fish play a significant role, but that isn't it. His it is being able to go out there, maybe uh, have, a, have an iced tea or an adult beverage, and watch what he's done by watching his water move and the waterfalls and the pools and the fish and all of it, and then see the scenery that he's got even beyond that. You know, Danny Mac, he's kind of a tinker. He likes to figure out things like, how do I have a make it come up with a device that can turn my aeration system on and off at a certain temperature? You know, so the it for him is to be able to go enjoy it. He doesn't want to go out there and pull weeds and, and, and you know, and, and rearrange rocks and all, even though he's done all that. He wants to go out there and enjoy it. So one of the things I really tried to drive home, and I think these guys got it pretty good, was what I call the it. What is it? When I first talk to it, start talking to a landowner, I'm asking them questions. Tell me why you bought the place. Why? Why do you have this land? Why do you want to build a lake? Why do you have a lake? You know, what is it that you're thinking? Let's fast forward five years. What does that look like to you? You know, and so as I begin these conversations, I'm also trying to figure out in their mind just how they think, you know, how they get here. What kind of business are they in? How they get to be successful? You know, how can I help get them to visualize their dreams for this piece of property that they've bought? And so when I start getting to that point, then it starts to get a little bit easier to figure out the it. And for example, as we were starting to wrap up the Institute on Saturday, the landowner who hosted us, uh, he and his wife have a venue there. We paid rent and you know overnight charges and all that, room nights for the venue. Well, he kept popping in and out. Well, he's got uh, three ponds on his place, and one of them is his favorite. There's another one he really doesn't care that much about. So he made that clear to us. But also he made a comment that just really struck me. He was talking about how the favorite pond, his wife loves to fish in that pond. And he said one of their favorite things is for both of them to go up there, put a minnow under a bobber, and catch some bass. And he's, he's caught some pretty big, fi- pretty big fish there as well. So I stored that in my mind. And as I'm listening to him, this, this one pond is too shallow. It's been drawn down. It could be a lot bigger. It could be a lot deeper, and it could be reshaped. But, you know, that's dirt moving money, you know? So as I'm listening to him, he, 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 he's he got a brash side about him, which I, I, I totally appreciate that. And he's right there in the crowd, and he says, you know what? I don't give a sh- about that pond. I really don't. So then I let him finish talking, and then I asked the, everybody in the room, I said, okay, what do you think he thinks about that pond? Every one of them said, he doesn't give a sh- about that pond. So I said, okay, guys, now, here's why the pond boss gets to do stuff you don't. Listen to this. So I said, Donnie, let me ask you a question. Do you love your wife? He goes, oh, no, I know what you're going to do to me now. I said, what if you took that pond and renovated that little pond just to be exactly for your wife and name it after her? What if you created a, a, a special place? She's been wanting to learn to fly fish. I heard her say that. And what if, what if you created a very cool place where she could strip line and she could fan cast based on the wind and learn how to fly fish? What's that worth? And what if you created several places where she could just sit and read a book and look at the pond? What if you had a floating island covered in beautiful flowers? You think she'd like that? Shut up. I know she would like that. So I said, now, do you still not give a sh- about that pond? He said, you know what, you're right, we really need to think about that because my wife would love that. So maybe that's your Christmas present. So all these guys smiled really big because with that, and I don't know what he'll do with that pond. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I threw it out there and we'll see if it sticks on his wall. 
But where I'm going with that is everybody has an it, and even the fisheries biologists, you got to figure out what that it is. So I'm going to tell you guys to think about your it. And if you'll do that, then the fish will play a role in your it. Hello, Jim Zalen. James Allen checking in from Kentucky. Let's see. Uh, Larry Hardesty, greetings. Danny Mac, let's see. Danny Mac, I paid a subcontractor that does all that rock moving, weed eating, etc. Also protecting the pecan trees from. How do you protect the pecan tree from a squirrel? Those squirrels can jump. I guess you put a big old uh, metal something around the trunk where they can't get there and make sure they're trimmed up high enough off the ground. So let's hit, and, and I do want to do some fisheries talk here as well. So um, I do want to talk a little bit about some of my take-home points from this Institute of Higher Pondology and add a couple of pretty good take-home points from today's stuff that I did to, uh, working on these lakes. This uh, one lake over in, in uh, north of Belzoni, Mississippi at Rivers Run Ranch which used to be owned by Will Primos, who sold it to the guy that owns it now. He wanted to build his own lake and his own lodge on that renowned hunting property. So I guess it's 2019, he found me and we started talking. And I helped him, I coached him up on how to design the best habitat. We looked at the elevations and tried to figure that out, which we did. Because it sits in a, that part of that ranch sits in a flood zone where the Yazoo River the way the Corps of Engineers manages that river, oftentimes they'll block it to keep water from going too fast into the Mississippi River and keep that water backed up for months at a time before they release it into the river. And they flood thousands of acres of rich farmland. And that water can back up onto this property, which is pretty far away. You know, So we had to be sure that this pond was built above that floodplain. Now, in that area around Belzoni, that used to be known as the catfish capital of the nation. Uh, hundreds or not, thousands of acres of catfish ponds. And now a lot of those ponds are out of production because the economics just don't make sense. Uh, it's kind of a shame to drive around there and see all these catfish ponds growing up in CRP. You know, where they, they've all got cottonwood trees and elm trees and willow trees growing up in them. And they'll never be fish ponds again. But that's the way the thing works. So anyway, uh, we had stocked bluegills in that lake and fathead minnows with red ear and fed the fish. We managed the water, stocked some bass in it about, oh, July of 2021. The water was hot when the, blue, when the bass were stocked. And the landowner, Brett, was a little worried because he hadn't been seeing any bass. So here we are a, a, a year and like four five months after the bass were stocked. So I uh, hollered at uh, Sean McNulty to bring the electric fishing boat over there, which we did. Tens of thousands of bluegills in about seven or eight size classes. I saw three size classes from this year. So that thing is chock full of bluegill, not one bass. So something happened in there, and it, it's most likely happened the day the fish were stocked. If they weren't tempered properly, if they weren't adjusted to that lake properly, weren't released properly, it didn't work. So now we got to come back in and figure out how to correct it. So uh, what Sean says is he's going to bring some F1 tiger bass that are feed trained, that are 10 or 11 inches long, stock them in on top of that those forage fish, ramp up the feeding, and those fish ought to grow like crazy. So my, my take home, and oh, oh, something else real important. If you'll, after we're through here, scroll down, you can see on the fa on this Facebook page, you can see a little segment of the electrofishing survey and see all those bluegills on, on kind of an early pass. But one of the things that, you know, being a fisheries biologist, I'm always looking for clues. I'm always looking for something that's going to tell me something about that pond. Well, as you walk out on the dock, a uh, big long dock, I see some scat laying on the dock. And I always look at that. It makes sense to me because I might see something. Well, these other guys walked right past it, never even saw it, and I looked, and it was full of fish scales. So uh, closer I looked at it, I thought, ah, oh, I'm going to put this on Facebook because people need to see this. It's otter poop. <laughs> so without ever seeing an otter, we know there's an otter in that lake. So I showed that to the to the ranch owner, his buddies, and to the... Um, property manager 
said, you guys start need to start being on the lookout for river otters, especially when these bass are stocked in that lake. So I'm always looking for clues, and that was a really, really distinct clue. There's not many mammals that leave a, a trail of poop behind full of scales, and river otters are the prime suspect. Let's see here. Let me scroll on down here. Let's see here. Pellet gun. <laughs> That's how you keep the squirrels out of the trees. Okay. Yep, I'm a slacker, dude. I'm running late. I'm running late. Hey, I hoofed it as fast as I could. Christopher Aguilar, Boudin man. So, uh, you know, I, I drove like a bat out of hell to get over here because I wanted to do that. I didn't want to do it from my truck because it's about to get dark, you know. So here we go. Got to talk to Ron Ardwan today. No, yeah, Boudin. Ardwan. <laughs> I can see him throwing a Boudin ball at me right now. Okay, let's see. Doug Cusick says, morning water temperature was 52 to 55. Oh, it scrolled away. This afternoon, catfish still coming up. Good. Yeah, you know what? And they're gonna they're gonna come and feed until the water temperature gets down into the into the really low fifties. Let me go back up here to Frank James. Okay, uh, when the ponds fill back up again, holy cow! Everything's happening here. It's scrolling past me. Let me find it. Will it? Okay, let me see here. What will happen to the inundated pond weeds? Will they deprive the water of oxygen? No, they won't. And now, well, I'm going to tell you this. When, when a pond is drawn down four or five feet, there's not the same mass of aquatic plants that would be growing as it would be if it were full. Now, it's because the water level has continued to drop and recede from those plants. So what will happen now, and, and, and this time of year, they're getting ready to go dormant. I looked at the lake this afternoon on my way through Shreveport. I had to spend about, I think I spent 30 minutes, 40 minutes there, and... The bushy pond weed, you could see it. It was going dormant. The algae was going dormant. So as these plants go dormant, their photosynthesis levels diminish drastically, and then they begin to decompose a little bit. So the risk of these plants um, sucking oxygen out of the water is higher when the water is low than if the, the, the pond is full. Because when the pond fills up, you know, and remember this, the top three feet in most lakes is the same volume of water as the entire rest of the lake. And if you do that math and you figure out the geometry, you're going to see that that's, that that's a fair statement. <clears throat> and so what happens is when you get double the water, the water rises, the plants are on their way out anyway right now, so they're dying anyway, and you're going to have more water helping execute that decomposition and breakdown of those plants. So it's not going to be nearly as much of a problem as it would be had this happened in uh, July or August. Now, what what uh, what he's talking about, everybody, is there's big rains in the forecast. A big front coming down, coming through the Rocky Mountains right now, about to blow across East Texas where this lake is. And, you know, when that water comes in with plenty of runoff, it's going to fill some ponds up, is what it sounds like. So, and that's Frank James's answer. All right, let me see here. Let me scroll down here and see what we got. Slacker, he says. <laughs> beaver took out my corkscrew willow tree that was caged by my dock. I trapped the beaver overnight in my small. You know what? Those dead gum beavers, they're, they're so industrious. I wish we could get young people to work like that on a fish farm. You know, those beavers, they're so dadgum industrious. And if you had it caged, if you had wire around it, the dadgum beaver, you know, I hate it that they did that. And uh, that's what they do. Hello, Elena Brinkman. Good to see you, dear. Todd Austin, Sharm, Miss Blake. Can you have too many spawning beds in a quarter acre pond? How do raider sunfish spawning beds differ from smallmouth bass spawning beds? Or smallmouth bass spawning beds a waste of time? Myth those one at a time. Can you have too many spawning beds in a quarter acre pond? I'd say you can, but most people don't. Um, one thing that was interesting to me on that lake this morning over in Mississippi where I was, uh, that lake is eight acres, and I had them put 15 spawning beds around that lake. And, boy, the minute you walk up on that lake, you can see bluegill everywhere. 
You can see the little bitty ones. There's several areas of riprap around that lake, and those little bluegill are just right up in that riprap. And just beyond that riprap, there's some three and four inch bluegills. Then as you get out around the feeders, there's five to eight inch bluegills out there. Well, what the, one of my first thoughts was, whoa, these bluegill are spawning so well, did we overdo it? Well, there's no bass in the lake. So I'm real convinced we didn't overdo it. Here's your answer. If you put more than about two or three spawning beds in a quarter acre pond, you don't need more than that. Spawning bed needs to be gravel or sand, preferably gravel on top of geotech cloth in water 18 inches to three feet deep. I think three feet deep is smarter. They'll use it. And your spawning beds in a quarter acre pond need to be about as big as the hood of a pickup truck. So if you've got three of those, you know, and they can be as big as a pickup if you've got the space for it, that's enough. How do red ear sunfish spawning beds differ? Uh, they, the red ear sunfish actually spawn in the same beds bluegill do. They just do it at a different temperature. So what happens is, is the bluegill come in and they spawn. Then as they exit, and when they're finished with their spawn, red ears are coming in and they start to spawn. Uh, in some areas of the country, where red ears and bluegill coexist, which, which is the south and southeast, a little bit of the Midwest, I have seen, um, it's not unusual to see some hybridization where a male red ear might sneak in on a bed and fertilize a few eggs, you know, and, and, and have some hybrids show up. So are spawning, smallmouth spawning beds a waste of time? No. If you've got smallmouth bass in a pond and you want them to reproduce, you really need to build them a bed or two or three, like in a quarter acre pond, if you had two good smallmouth spawning beds, you're more likely to be able to get your smallmouth bass to reproduce. Now there's other factors besides the bed, but the question you asked, are they a waste of time? No, they aren't. Now there's other factors like bluegill will eat the eggs or eat the babies. You know, largemouth bass will outcompete them. They'll run them off the beds. So you got all kinds of little behavioral things that can influence it. But it's not a waste of time for you to have spawning beds for smallmouth bass. So, hey, it's a little after 7. Let's do a commercial right quick. By the way, y'all remember the deal. Hashtag Palm Moss Magazine in the comments section. Click like. Share this video to your timeline and you're eligible for drawing for a Palm Moss hat and a Palm Moss something else that Leanne sends out. I think she sent a t-shirt last time. And uh, that, we had a drawing a couple of weeks ago. Or maybe it's last week. I forget. But, um... If you guys will do that, I'd appreciate it. And I want to tell you something. You guys you guys that love to hunt, I want you to go look at huntbirddog.com. That's a really innovative, creative, exciting new uh, way of getting an opportunity to hunt. And basically what it is is my son Jonathan came up with the idea, and he and his longtime college roommate launched a company, launched this business. And they've raised money to, to create the business and do it right. So basically what they're doing is they're working with ranchers, you know, that have wildlife, that they that a harvestable surplus of wildlife, and they work with that rancher and, and create an experience, then turn around and sell it to their hunters. And they've got like 15 ranches so far, and they got around 100 hunters. And so they come up with these different events. And so you can go on there, kind of like VRBO or Airbnb, and you guys, when you get a chance, click on it, and you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, they had an alligator hunt, and he combined the alligator hunt with a gambling trip to Horseshoe Casino in Lake Charles, Louisiana. They had like 12, 13 people go, and they harvested 114 alligators. Go figure. But they've got affordable hunts. They've got some high-dollar hunts. They've got... Hunts that would suit what you'd like to do if you want to go hunt. And the thing I like most about it is you can book it online, you know, and then be communicated with Jonathan and his and his team, and it might you might book it two weeks out. You know, and in, in Texas, especially if you want to hunt, you gotta know somebody. And they gotta invite you to hunt, or you gotta invite yourself. Or you can sign a lease, get a hunting lease. That's traditional. Hunting leases have gone out of sight, price-wise and liability-wise. These, these ranch owners, a lot of these ranches that are for lease are now in a trust, or there's 14 or 30 heirs to the ranch because the original folks have died off. 
you know, and they want you to give them a liability policy that covers you and anything that could go wrong on the ranch, you know, or you can work with an outfitter. And that means trying to find a good outfitter, schedule them, you know, avoid cancellations, go to a trade show to book a hunt. You know, we're at birddog or huntbirddog.com is a totally different concept. So, there you go. Look at there. Um, let me see who all we got here going on. Oh, oh, other commercials. Look, before I forget, Karina Mills, Aquamax Speed. I see Peyton Nago is, uh, he's, he's on watching the show. He ran up to Arkansas, did some work. He's who I connected up with today to do a quick look at, at a lake that he's managing just kind of west of uh, Shreveport, almost in, the, in Texas, just east of the line there, south, or no, I guess a little bit north of Interstate 20. And he's got some aquatic plants. He's trying to figure out how to deal with those and then what are some things he can do to make the lake better. So we had a great conversation, and we talked about plants. We talked about water. And he's probably going to electrofish that, that lake here in a few days. See if we can figure that out. So, hey, Peyton, good to see you, buddy. Peyton was also at the Institute of Higher Pondology last week. Boy, he soaked it all in. Let me see here. Troy Todd, Wesley Ellis from Northwest Georgia. Doug, I did not get my T-shirt yet that I won. Do you know if Leanne sent it? Um, I don't know, Doug, but I know this. If you if you emailed her your address, if, if she hasn't done it, she will. You know, I think... I don't remember how that went. I don't remember if you put it on this thread and I sent it to her. Um, send an email to info at pondboss.com and, and I'll see it solely in. And that'll remind her. If she's already sent it, she'll respond to you with that email and tell you if she sent it. But she's usually pretty good about that. Greg Baird, what's the hardest thing for a fisherman to catch? A girlfriend. Depends on the bait. Remember this. Depends on your bait. I'm going to leave that right there. So, Purina Mills, Aquamax line of fish foods. I trust those fish foods. Matter of fact, Peyton and I talked about that today. Uh, they've got some bluegill that are a little bit thin, and it's because they're eating a grain based fish food. So, he's going to switch over to Aquamax MVP for the next month and a half, or however long those fish will eat, and those bluegill will fatten up. And He'll be able to see a difference. If he puts that feed out there now and feeds those fish consistently, he will see some changes within uh, within four weeks. He'll see those fish get thicker. Um, and Purina does it. Texas Hunter feeders. Texas Hunter sent a guy over there to the Institute last week. So we got to hear from Heath Stanford talking about the Texas Hunter products. He brought all the new fish habitat stuff. So Texas Hunter Products has Texas Angler Products, where they've created through a, a, a really diligent set of research with Auburn University how to come up with some artificial habitat that fills a different niche than those other products that are already on the market, like Mossback, for example. So uh, there's some new products out there. Um, all right, so the other thing I want to talk about with Fisheries Management 101 the purpose for electrofishing surveys, since we did one this morning, we talked about one this afternoon, we electrofished a lake last week, <clears throat> that's a really interesting lake. I'm going to tell you about it. That lake covers about 20 acres, and when we launched the electrofishing boat, there's several things we're wanting to do. We want to get a representative sample of the fish population. So we want to be able to see the different size ratios of the different species of fish. We want to be able to see what kind of shape they're in. We want to identify the different species. And in this 20 acre lake, we caught, I think 12, only 12 catchable size largemouth bass. We saw four size classes of bluegill. Their numbers were low. Threadfin shad, their numbers were low. We found gizzard shad about that big. Their numbers were low. We found silver sides minnows. We shocked up one. We got a golden shiner. We got red ear sunfish, black crappie. One of the black crappie we had has got the black stripe up its nose. So I know that fish was bought originally from a fish hatchery. They're black nose crappie or black stripe crappie. Kind of different. 
Elena, my sister and I bought, brought some bastards. Your daddy sent me pictures of that. I think you girls are fantastic. I just love the fact that you're growing up and that, that with around water and big fish and you got to go do a show and tell and best show and tell ever. You know, I, I know it was. It had to be because y'all are the best shower and tellers ever. Way to go, Elena. Good job, girl. Way to go. Way to go. Good stuff. So now as we're shocking this lake, we're seeing um, red ear sunfish, but not many. We saw one warmouth. We saw three or four green sunfish. So we saw these different species of fish, but the numbers were way, way, way low. One of the things we do when we're electrofishing is we like to check out what we call catch per unit of effort. So what that means to us in the private pond side, it, that, that CPUE has a different meaning based on the application, but for us it's how many minutes you're on the electrofishing pedal on the, on the boat putting electricity in the water compared to how many fish you capture. Well, in a, in a trophy bass lake, your catch rate's pretty low. It's like 25 bass in an hour, you know, up to 30, 35, 40. So the numbers are lower because the fish are bigger. And that's trophy bass management. For more of a balanced fishery, the numbers are more like 50 to 75, 50 to 65, 40 to 60, in there somewhere per hour on the pedal. Crowded bass, over 75. And I've seen, I have seen lakes where the catch rate would be 250 bass per hour. They're all cookie cutter car carbon copies. 10 or 11 inches low, long, and way low on weight. Well, in this lake, the lake was down about four feet, maybe five feet. We saw no spawning beds around the perimeter. When you first pull in the gate, there's no grass on the pastures. There's cattle everywhere. There's a clue. And so the fish numbers were super low. Water clarity was 36 inches. There was no plankton bloom to be had anywhere. So the electrofishing survey, our CPUE for that lake was six bass per hour. That's terrible. That, those numbers are so low. But typically, when you shock a lake and the bass numbers are that low, the bluegill numbers just erupt and there's zillions of them. Or threadfin shad, thousands and thousands. We didn't see that. <clears throat> so the conclusions we all drew as a group is that productivity of that lake has been interfered with and interrupted. Habitat was minimal. There's some vertical timber standing dead trees out in the middle of the lake along what used to be a, um, a creek channel. You know, and so the habitat's lacking, the water wasn't productive, the fish numbers are low, the food chain was low. So as we talked about it, I tried to guide the guys through what what I was thinking about, but I wanted to hear what they were thinking about first. And all of them said, you know what? It, it, here's the process when I analyze a lake. First thing I look at is the water. Is the water healthy? Is it productive? Are there any clues? Do I see any indications that it's not? Any indicator species that aren't growing or that are growing? You know, and then from that, that triggers me on what to do about the water. Do we have it analyzed at, the, uh, at an aquatics lab or at a soil sciences lab? Do we need to see the water chemistry? What's going on with it? You know, I didn't see anything that really triggered that other than the water was just a little bit of a turbid light blue color with 36 inch visibility. And in that soil type over there, which has got some clay in it, you'd think that water would have more of a green tint. Well, it didn't. So the next thing was we saw no spawning beds, nowhere. Not on dry ground, not under the water. Nowhere did we see any spawning colonies of, of red ear or bluegill sunfish. Not one. Nowhere. So where'd they go? So I gave you a clue a while ago. The conclusion we came to is there's so many cattle on that small piece of property that they've overgrazed all the grass. The grass is gone. The buffer zone is gone. The lake is drawn down. They've trampled all the spawning beds. When bluegills were spawning, they were spawning in shallow water, and the cattle in droves would come down and drink water and, and walk around in it and muddy the water up and change the chemistry of the water. Now, there's another pond on that place, so 
my first recommendation was to get the cows off. Fence them off. You know, let them, let them go drink out of the other pond. You know, so it's very rarely do I get fisheries advice where I tell somebody to get the cows away from a lake. But it's not unusual to make the recommendation, but it's, it's unusual to make the recommendation because the cattle has influenced that fishery so much. But that's what we did. So um, let's see here. So there's a little bit of Fisheries 101. Clean line painting. I have black nose cropping my crab. They're pretty cool looking fish. Let's see here. John Henry, good to see you, buddy. Mitchell Jordan, I plan to add new brush piles to my pond. What depths do you recommend? You want the brush piles to be in water like eight feet deep, five feet tall. They don't need to really be manifested at the surface because if they are, then it's more likely for predators to come eat your fish. So I like to see like a five foot tall cedar tree, for example, or if it's gonna be a brush pile, here's what I'm gonna tell you. Make the brush piles. Uh, they don't have to be compact, but they need to be kind of dense for bait fish to get in. And if you can make them four feet square or six feet square and four feet tall, that's perfect. Or if you're going to, like what, what, what I'm going to recommend to this landowner down in the, uh, where we shocked that lake with low numbers of fish, is while this lake is down, I think he needs to lash some cedar trees to the standing dead timber. He's probably got 30 or 40 standing dead trees that he can either hang cedar trees like Christmas ornaments off the limbs or lash them to the trunk. So there's some things he can do habitat wise that can make a big difference. Jay Spires, hey Bob on feeding. I see tons of videos of folks feeding and their bluegill blowing up the water. Wondering why mine don't seem to be as explosive. Back in the summer, feeding early morning. Oop, uh oh, I lost it. Back in the summer, was feeding early morning, later afternoon, and again before the dark, before dark. Time was changed on feeding due to the blue heron and trying to prevent them from eating the fish. Is it possible I'm feeding often so they aren't as hungry or they're eating enough that they aren't that hungry when I happen to be there while they're eating? They seem to be growing well and saw beds all summer. Didn't know if you had anybody. Okay, let me tell you what I see there. <clears throat> if you're feeding three times a day, then odds are pretty high that you're satiating the population. And if you're feeding once a, once a day, you're, you're, you're feeding and satiating the feed hogs. So just because you don't see them doesn't mean they're not eating. The other thing that would trigger me to ask a question is what kind of feed you're using. If you're using a, a good high protein fish meal based fish food like MVP, Purina's MVP, Aquamax, then you're going to see them be a little bit more hangry because they're going to come after that because it's more palatable and it's got ingredients in it that their bodies need. If you're feeding grain-based fish food like there were over there at that pond we looked at today where the bluegills are skinny, I made this comparison. Feeding a grain-based fish food to bluegill is like you and I eating a donut. It tastes good, we like it, and only puts fat on. Whereas if the, like the Aquamax MVP, that is like a T-bone steak. You know, so it's got the protein that those fish need to really gain weight. So uh, Aquamax MVP. Okay, so if that's what you're feeding, then if you're feeding them to satiation, um, once the density increases and you have more numbers of bluegill, that's when you'll see them get a lot more aggressive with their feeding. Now, right now the water temperature is dropping. So as the water temperature drops, their aggressive nature is going to drop. So be ready for that. So um, hit me with some more questions. In the meantime, I wanted to hit a couple of more fisheries 101 points. One thing I think is real important, especially this time of year, your fish are gaining weight as fast as they can right now based on what they have to eat. Right now is a good time to be culling bass that need to be culled. Weigh and measure those fish and write that down because that gives you a good comparative analysis to look at from now till next spring, for example. So if you call some bass, weigh them and measure them. If you release some bass, weigh them and measure those and write those down. If you can track those lengths and weights, that will make a difference on what decisions you make even next spring. Um, Greg Russell, North Louisiana, when do I quit feeding Aquamax 500? 
I would quit feeding Aquamax 500 when it's obvious that the, the fish have stopped eating. So here's the way that works. If you're feeding that feed, you're feeding bluegills most likely. So they're going to eat that feed even now and because the water is like in the mid-60s right now. There's a front coming, so the temperature is going to drop. After the front passes, they will eat less. But when the water temperature hits in the uh, mid-40s, that's when they're really going to slow down a lot. So I'd say feed them until your water temperature hits about 45 or 46, and you see zero activity, and then cut it off. And then when the temperature comes back up into the 50s, pick it back up again. So um, to kind of give you an idea about this, right now the fish are feeding as much as they can, eating as much as they can, so they can gain weight before going into the winter. Because instinctively, they know that um, that they've got to gain some body weight to make it through a hard winter. Union Paris, they're still killing it. Then keep feeding it. They're going to tell you when they're done because they quit coming. You know, and when they quit coming, they will. And typically, what will happen is you'll get some back-to-back -back cold fronts. And just before the front, they'll feed like crazy. Then after the front passes, they won't feed nearly as well. And then three or four days after the front passes, they'll feed again. So plan on them, um, plan on quitting feeding. I tell you what, if you guys don't have a thermometer to check your water temperature, get a thermometer. You really need that. Temperature is a big deal. Temperature helps influence your timing. You know, now realtors tell you the three most important things about real estate is location, location, location. The three most important things about fish and pond management is timing, timing, timing. So you need to, um, uh, have a thermometer and I'd buy a Sechi disc. A Sechi disc allows you to see the visibility. So if you got a thermometer where you can check the temperature and you've got a Sechi disc to check the visibility, that's two tools that would benefit you a lot. Troy Todd's asking at what percent relative weight for culling largemouth bass do you recommend for a balanced fishery with a good catch rate? I'm going to tell you relative weights that sink below 90 for longer than a month, those fish need to be caught. So fish that are 80, 85, 88% relative weight through the course of a year, those are fish to be caught. You know, now that's in, in a typical pond, that's going to be bass that are at range in size from 10 to 15 inches long. If there's 17 inch bass that are at 88%, you get something else going on that you need to figure out. Which in that case, it's either the fish have aged out or it's because um, that size class of fish has run out of food, you know? And so the answer to that is, is if it's relative weights below 90, and I'm talking about 80, 85, 88. If it's, if, it's, if it's 89 and the fish looks pretty good and it's the fall, throw it back. But if it's 85, looks skinny, has been like that for a while, Take it out. Have disc, no thermometer. Man, that sounds like Paladin to me. Have gun, will travel. So there you go. So um, I'd get a thermometer. Um, there, you, you can find them online all, all day long. It doesn't have to be digital. It can be one that you carry in your shirt pocket like an ink pen with a cord on it. You know, Put it in your bib on your bib overalls. Put it in a little pocket up there. So, hey, guys, it's 7.30. Uh, I hear my grandkids coming back through the front door, and I know they're dying to play with me because I haven't seen them all week long. So I'm going to cut loose here in just a second. Let's see, James Allen, what's a reasonable largemouth bass length for birth first and second year? Oh, okay, what's a reasonable largemouth bass? Okay, so if you stock largemouth bass, say you stock fingerlings in a brand-new pond in June, I'm going to tell you, and he stocked them on, on top of a, a pond that's set up for it with lots of fathead minnows, bluegill reproducing, etc. You're going to see bass that range in size from 8 inches at the smallest up to 14 inches at the biggest in, in the fall, like this time of the year. If you stock those fairlings and they've got all the food they need, the best of the best, and you've heard me talk about this before, 
they're going to be up around 13 to 14 inches long and weigh a pound and a quarter to a pound and a half after, you know, eight months, six months, seven months, whatever that is. And then the smallest ones will be about eight inches long. So then after the second year, they're really going to differentiate themselves beyond that. The biggest ones will be knocking on the door of uh, 18 inches, maybe a little bit more than that. I've actually seen several um, two-year-old bass, say two years and four months, two, two and a quarter years old, that were, were uh, pushing almost five pounds. And those are exceptional. You don't see very many of those. But by, by, the, by the end of their second full season, it's not unusual to see a lot of them that are 14 ounces up to two and a quarter pounds. So that's, uh, that's the answer to that. Let's see here. Clean line painting, Central Ohio here. Never has an acre and a half pond that is two years old. It's been stocked with the usual suspects, plus a small amount of hybrid striped bass. He needed dirt for another project, so this pond was dug deep over 20 feet. If you were to install aeration, do you think it would support a year-round trout fishery? No. I think what will happen is there'll be five or six days in the summer in central Ohio where the water temperature gets a little bit too hot for trout. But I think if he had a strategy behind how he used aeration, he could, he could hedge his bets a little bit. But I haven't seen too many ponds in south of in central Ohio, maybe. You know, but odds are that that, here, here's, the, here's the deal breaker. When the water temperature goes above 70, it's affinity for oxygen. Hey kids, I love you, I'll be out there in a minute. When the water temperature gets above 70, it's affinity for the uh, oxygen goes down. So trout have to have seven parts per million. If they don't have that, they're going to die. So uh, anyway, I'm going to wrap up. Thanks for letting me be late. You didn't have a lot of choice, but I appreciate you guys watching and I appreciate the comments and all the shares. So uh, next Wednesday, where am I going to be? Actually, I think I'm going to be here. Hi, Pumpkin, I'm coming. So until next week, I'm going to tell all y'all, adios. See you then.